So there are less bacteria. So even that little paper that I handed out, again, it's not collecting that. It's just if you like to take notes, organize notes that way. Um, it's only one sheet. <laughs> so there are less bacteria in our last group. So my plan was I'll get through all of them in lecture today. Uh, they're grouped together just because there are unusual bacteria. They're either an unusual shape or they behave in an unusual way or they're transmitted unusually. So they kind of are just like a little misfit group of bacteria. And there are four groups of our unusual bacteria. There's a rickettsia group, a chlamydia group, a spirochete group, and a vibrio group. And so we're just gonna talk about all four of them. Um, and the bacteria that are commonly causing human diseases in those groups. My note for these groups, these, the bacteria we cover are not at all the only bacteria that are in these four groups. We are just going over the top disease causing bacteria found in these groups. Because I know there are some other vibrios that cause disease, which is not super common, and so we just don't talk about them. But I know your book goes into a lot of other bacteria in these groups. We're just going over the more common ones that you may actually encounter or have patients in the future that have encountered some of these. So our rickettsia group, the chlamydias, the spirochetes, and the vibrios. Now, some of these you're like, oh, I've heard of some of these names before. Um, a lot of times, especially when we get into the spirochete group, um, a lot of people haven't always heard of the actual genus name of the bacteria, but they have definitely heard of the disease that the bacteria cause. So sometimes you don't recognize the bacteria name, but you recognize the disease, because one of them is extremely common. But we're first gonna talk about our rickettsia group. And in this group, we're gonna talk about three bacteria, the rickettsia, ehrlichia, and anoplasma. So three genus of bacteria, that's all in the rickettsia group. One of them does have the genus name of rickettsia, and thus it's in the rickettsia group. Um, ehrlichia and anoplasma are still both rickettsia, so they still get that nice name that it's a rickettsia. Um, why they're all grouped together, partly it's because of their size. They are extremely small for bacteria. I mean, bacteria are small, <laughs> but these are like super, super small. Also, if when we gram stain them, they appear like they have almost no wall, and it really is because they have very little peptidoglycan. Now, I should note, all the bacteria that's in this chapter, all of our unusual misfit bacteria, are all gram-negative bacteria. And so, yes, they have even less peptidoglycan. So gram-negative already have a very thin cell wall. These have like the thinnest of the thinnest of the thinnest cell walls. Uh, they are also what are known as obligate intracellular parasites. So these are bacteria that will get inside of our cells. That's the intracellular. Obligate is because they are required to live inside of our cells. Um, they will get in there. They will, you know, eat whatever. They get their food from there. They get their energy from there. Um, like they literally become parasites to our cells, which when you have bacteria that are living inside of your cells and they are parasites, they are doing damage to our cells which is what leads to all the symptoms and all the bad things and how they affect us. So that's why they get grouped that way. But the first, that we're, first bacteria in here that we're gonna talk about is Rickettsia rickettsii. So that's the full bacteria name, the genus and species, and the disease that it causes is Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. I was online this morning trying to get a few more images. That's what I'm gonna have to um, How it is spread, ticks. So we haven't really gotten to any tick-borne bacteria yet, and we'll get into viruses coming up in our next unit. Um, do we have ticks around here? <laughs> yeah. It's like the one reason where I'm like, all right, I absolutely hate seeing snow in March, but it's like, mm, at least the ticks aren't out yet. Um, we do have ticks around here. Now, luckily for us, the ticks that this particular bacteria likes to hang out is not a very common tick. Um, they are found in dog ticks primarily, um, and dog ticks are actually really big ticks, so like if you get them on you, you're gonna see them very, very noticeably um, and remove it before you even get bitten. Um, what the bacteria does, again, it is a parasite of our cells, but the cells that this particular bacteria targets are the cells that line blood vessels. I'm actually gonna go back and forth for a second. So this is a stain. These are capillaries. So this is all of our blood vessels that are doing all that gas exchange. And I know it's hot right in here. Um, all the bright pink are the bacteria that are inside all of those cells that line our blood vessels. 
Again, if you've got bacteria inside the cells that line our blood vessels, they are destroying those blood vessel walls, which leads to one of the symptoms, which is a spotted rash. And so if you can see even on those top two pictures on the hands and appendages, usually the hands and feet are the first ones that show this, um, it's a rash, but it's not like an itchy rash, like you're allergic to something. It literally is like little broken blood vessels because those infected blood vessels are being destroyed. The walls are. So it looks like this little rash all over the appendages. Um, it's treatable. The idea is that you, you need to get treated. The sooner you get treated, the better you get treated. They usually say if you've been bitten by a tick and you're starting to show any kind of symptoms, um, go in right away. Don't wait to see if it gets better um, because it can be deadly if it's left untreated. So we do have antibiotics. They usually say you need to get treated within about five days of a bite for you to like really not have any complications. Have you noticed, are there a lot of cases here in Wisconsin? Um, it wasn't until 2018, I'm gonna see if this link will pop up. It wasn't until 2018, we even actually had any deaths from Rocky Mountain spotted fever in Wisconsin. Um, in 2018, and it all made the news, um, not just for Wisconsin, but the fact that it was someone in La Crosse County um, picked up this particular bacteria and died of it. Uh, super, super rare. Most cases of this bacteria being picked up by a tick is if someone travels, which everyone travels, but there's lots and lots of cases south of here. So when I say, oh, there's about eight cases, there's somewhere between five and 10 cases in Wisconsin diagnosed every year. So depending on where you work, um, you may have patients that have been diagnosed, but it's almost primarily because they've traveled somewhere, picked it up, and then brought it back and got diagnosed here. So it's not super commonly found in Wisconsin, but it is in Wisconsin. Most cases are picked up south of here. Other bacteria that are in this rickettsia group, again, they're parasites, they're super small, very, very thin peptidoglycan, are lichia and anoplasma. Uh, we kind of talk about them together because they both are also transmitted like ticks, like the Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Um, they are both emerging diseases, which means we're getting more and more cases of these every year. Um, they both kind of behave the same and almost look the same as well. So one of them that's Ehrlichia that we're seeing more cases of is Ehrlichia staphiensis, and another one is the Asmoplasma phagocytophilum, which is just a mouthful. Um, but based on its name, I like to break apart words, phago means eat, cyto means cell, and phylum knows the fill, it likes something. These are bacteria that like to be eaten. They are intracellular parasites, so they do want to get eaten by our phagocytes, but they figured out a way not to get digested. So I'm like, then they hide inside of our own cells. So they named it, you know, the whole actual species name just tells you a little bit about the organism. And anoplasmosis is the second, I want to say the number two reportable tick-borne disease in Wisconsin. And you guess what our number one tick-borne disease in Wisconsin is? Lyme Um, Because that's a bacteria as well. Now, just looking at the map, what do we have here in Wisconsin, based on the color? We got both. We do have cases of Ehrlichia and Anoplasma. I didn't like this because I was like, I was looking for this morning. I'm like, we're fortunate. We've got to have more updates. So I was trying to find um, a couple more maps. So this is showing the forecasted prevalence of Anoplasma, of uh, Anoplasmosis and Ehrlichiosis. That, yeah, there are quite a few cases of anoplasmosis here in Wisconsin. I guess that's the number two reportable tick-borne disease. So at some point in your career, you'll probably have a patient that has anoplasmosis. Um, ehrlichiosis, you know, we have some cases here in Wisconsin. I think I found actually two maps. This is 2020 and 2021, the most common. So the darker the blue, the more cases there are. This is showing cases per county in Wisconsin of anoplasmosis, the number of cases per county in ehrlichiosis. So generally for this one, it's like the farther north you go, it seems to be the higher number of cases. Um, but we do have them around here. Like in La Crosse County, I mean, it's a lighter color, but we do have, we've got cases of ehrlichiosis every year. Um, we don't, I don't know, we didn't have any in 2020, 
2020, but Monroe County is not too far away either. Um, I know they were saying, we'll get then into ticks as well, that there's like just an exorbitant amount of ticks like in the Sparta, Port McCoy area. And a lot of them are carriers of these bacteria as well as the bacteria that causes Lyme's disease. So if you're ever in those areas, you know, definitely call it out. Um, so you don't get bitten by ticks. Now, when I said they do like to get eaten, because they are intracellular parasites, they do go through three developmental stages. The first is they have to get eaten. But again, they don't get broken down. That's unique to these bacteria. The idea of a phagocyte is to go around and eat things and break them down. But they first become just this little elementary body in what's known as a phagosome. It's just like a little thing that they got eaten. But they can lose that little protective shell and not die. So then bacteria are going to do what they do best. They will start to reproduce. But when you have bacteria reproducing in your cell, that is still a trigger to our immune system that they there's something foreign in the cell, and so that our immune system doesn't target it for destruction, they will actually form their own unique protective shell. So this is not a protective shell that the, the cell made, it's a protective shell that the bacteria did called a marula. And then they can just reproduce at will. Um, and nothing's gonna trigger our immune system to get rid of them, um, and they're just gonna keep re reproducing and then releasing more and more of that bacteria. So this is, you know, what you know, a picture idealistic looks like, but we can actually see some of the bacteria inside these little marula inside of our cells. Now, treatment, because they do do damage to our cells, we do have antibiotics. So again, if there's any suspected symptoms, um, usually the biggest symptoms for these um, is a rash. It's usually fatigue, a headache. You know, your immune system is under attack since they are spread by ticks is what? I swear everyone's like, I'm just never leaving the house again. Um, but if you are going to leave the house, what should you do? If you know you're going to go hiking, camping in the woods. Afterwards, um, we always say wear long clothing, in which I know in the summer wear long clothing. Long clothing, light colored clothing, so if you do have a tick on you, you can see it. If you're wearing dark brown and black, it's hard to see those ticks. Um, and then even having the bug spray, anything that's got um, any of the, the DEET in it, the higher the DEET, the less the ticks like it. Hmm? Mm -mm. So, I was going to say, bug spray gets rid of mosquitoes and it keeps ticks off too. Yeah, but yep, ticks too. Um, so ticks, even say I'm like, if you know you're going to be out in the woods um, hiking around, you've got long pants on, put the socks on top of the pants. I know it doesn't look stylish, but a lot of ticks get, you know, they crawl up on your, your shoes, they crawl up on your socks, and then they crawl right up underneath your pants. So if you can put the socks on top of uh, the pants, you know, at least while you're hiking, it's one less way of getting ticks on you. Second group like a little intro slide. Our second group of our unusual bacteria are the bacteria that are in the chlamydia group. Now everyone's like, oh, chlamydia, I don't want chlamydia. Um, but there's more than one type of chlamydia. Yes, most people associate the word chlamydia with the number one chlamydia causing infection, which is an STD. But there are three common cause, or three common bacteria that cause human disease. Only one of them is, is a sexually transmitted bacteria. Why they're grouped in this little group of chlamydias, they are also extremely small. They are one of the smallest bacteria that exist. They are almost the size of a virus, but they're not a virus. They don't have any cell wall whatsoever. So they have like no peptidoglycan glycan whatsoever. They do still have two cell membranes. They're still a gram-negative organism. They just don't have any cell wall. They also are intracellular. They also live inside of our cells, but they do hold themselves off um, inside of little vesicles. Uh, the chlamydias cannot survive on their own. They cannot make ATP on their own. So a lot of times we call anything in the chlamydia group, they are energy parasites because they get inside of our cells and then they steal all the ATP that our cells make because they just can't make any of their own. So they have to live inside of our cells. 
Now, anything in this group, because I'll get into the top three bacteria, they are found in two different forms. So the bacteria are either found inside of an elementary body or a reticulate body. And I think I've got another picture here. Um, I'll bring my little clicker. I think it's in the lab. So the elementary body, which is the smaller. So this little tiny thing is the elementary body. This big, huge, lighter color thing is the reticulate body. The elementary body can survive out in the environment. It's almost like it's endospore type of state that it can hang out in the environment. It's slightly protective, but it's also the infective form. So this is the form that you would then pick up. And then it gets ingested into one of our cells because our immune system cells recognize bacteria. They eat it, but it doesn't get broken down because it's smart. Um, and once it does get inside of our cells, that elementary body flips the switch. It's like, oh, I'm in my happy place. I'm inside of a cell. There's ATP around. I am happy. I can now start to reproduce and make more of myself. And that's when it goes into this big, huge reticulate body. You can see it's lighter colored. This is where the bacteria is actually reproducing. An elementary body is just dormant, just waiting to get inside of a cell. The reticulate body is actively dividing, making lots and lots of bacteria, which then get released and then get eaten by another cell. And they just keep going through all of that, making lots of bacteria and infecting more and more cells. Now, number one chlamydia that does cause disease in humans is chlamydia trachomatis. And how it gets in the body, it gets in the body generally through any open wound, any scratch, any abrasion. Um, it gets into anywhere in the reproductive tract. That's kind of the top area. But it can also even just get in the conjunctiva of the eyes. So it usually causes the biggest issues on the eyes. And we'll get into some girls' pictures, um, as well as the mucous membranes of the reproductive tract. It is the number one reportable STD in the US. I think I had a picture. Um, I found this one this morning and added it on here. So across county, because we always care about across county, um, 2021 was the most updated one I could find. We haven't put out a 2022 yet. But the number of cases of chlamydia here in La Crosse County, um, 659 cases this year. That's a lot of cases of chlamydia. Age group, age group, age group is 15 to 29. I was going to say primarily it's the 19 to 24 age group. What age group is that? Um, they even did a whole report. They were looking at, I'm going to say it wrong because I don't want to flip them around. I didn't write it down. Um, they looked at the number of chlamydia and the number of gonorrhea in La Crosse County, um, because gonorrhea, also another STD, um, 158 cases. If I remember this correctly, although yes, age-wise, it is college students. Um, pretty much all of them, any STD is generally the college student, just the highest number of cases. Um, but they actually looked at it that chlamydia was not just they looked in La Crosse County, they literally looked at it by neighborhoods and addresses for people that were reporting it, and then yes, it was like the number of cases of chlamydia, everyone lived right around the, you know, the UWL, Western, and Viterbo campuses in La Crosse County. Um, but gonorrhea was not actually focused around La Crosse County. It was focused on the north side of La Crosse. It was kind of interesting, like, oh, I don't know what's going on on the north side, but uh, this is generally all college students. That's the, where all the cases are. So lots of cases. Clinical manifestations, so all the symptoms and signs that we're going to get into shortly, are all based on cell damage. So these bacteria, again, they are energy parasites. They're getting inside of our cells. They are stealing all of our energy. Our cells are dying, which causes all of our side effects. And they are a top cause of eye infections because they can get into that conjunctiva of the eye, um, which usually primarily is the number one not number one, but it's a top eye infection, usually of infants or newborns. Meaning mom had chlamydia, may have been asymptomatic, had no idea whatsoever um, during childbirth, passed that bacteria on from the reproductive tract into the conjunctiva of the eye. Diseases, depends whether you picked it up uh, sexually or whether you picked it up because you got it into the eye, depends on which disease you have. 
If you have an STD, some of the things that it will cause is that's called non-gonococcal urethritis. Pretty much means um, the non-cockal, so it's non cocci shaped which pretty much is just telling you it's not Neisseria gonorrhea. Um, but it causes urethritis, so that's inflammation of the urethra. What do you think the, num the, the symptom of an inflamed, inflamed urethra is? Um, that's nonococcal urethritis. It hurts when you pee, but it's not a cocci shaped bacteria, which means they've eliminated that it's not Neisseria gonorrhea, which is pretty much going to lead you to this. It also causes what's known as a lymphogranuloma venereum, which means you have inflamed lymph nodes. Not as bad, not as, bad as, you know, the, the buboes uh, for the bubonic plates, but you do have inflamed lymph nodes. It also can cause proctitis and pelvic inflammatory disease. So you're going to have inflammation pretty much anywhere near um, the rectum, anywhere near um, the urethra, and because the bacteria can get into the reproductive system, specifically of females, it can get in and cause inflammation of the entire female reproductive tract, which can possibly lead to sterility later on in life if left untreated for long periods of time. If it gets into the eyes, um, it's now an ocular disease called trachoma. So trachoma is the official name of the disease. It's just an ocular disease that's affecting the eyes. And it is the number one cause of non-traumatic blindness, which means it can cause blindness, but it's non-traumatic. It's not like you went blind because, you know, you got a stick in the eye or something. Um, why it causes non-traumatic blindness? So as the bacteria gets in the eye and causes inflammation, this is just, you know, the gunky stuff on the bacterial infection. Again, infants are the number one group that do pick it up. Um, it causes damage to the cornea that will actually cause the eyelid to flip inside out, um, which is going to cause even more damage to the cornea to the point that it will cause you to go blind. Again, it's normally picked up. The highest number of cases are infants during childbirth, and it is one of the reasons why uh, if you give birth in the hospitals, one of the very first things they do after the kid is born, you know, they clean them up or whatever, is they put antibiotic ointment right inside the eyes. I mean, there are lots of different bacteria that can be in the female reproductive tract that they can pick up. This is one of them. Diagnosing someone for chlamydia trachomatis, um, they can look at the bacteria underneath the microscope. A lot of times they do a staining procedure that they will actually make the bacteria glow. A lot easier to see then. And so they can do some of kind of antibody fluorescent tests to make the bacteria glow under the microscope and find them. Um, that's kind of putsy. And so most often they're just going to do molecular tests. They're just going to specifically look for the DNA of the bacteria. Treatments, antibiotics work. Penicillin seems to be the best and most effective of the antibiotics that works. If there is an infection in the eyes, they might have to do some type of surgical correction uh, to stop any further damage. The best bet is just prevention. It's abstinence, mutual monogamy, and condoms. Um, condoms are not 100% effective, but they will decrease the chance of spreading it a lot. Um, and then they treat infants at childbirth as well with antibiotics. Like before waiting until anything happens, they just treat them with antibiotics in their eyes. There are two other bacteria that are in this chlamydia group that can cause human disease. The one is called Chlamydophila pneumoniae. And yes, based on its name, it causes about 10% of pneumonia cases. And so, again, lots of things can cause pneumonia. It just means fluid in the lungs. Um, bacteria can cause pneumonia. Viruses can cause pneumonia. Well, there are some of bacteria in this group that also cause pneumonia. It also causes about 5% of bronchitis and sinus infection cases as well. So if you're like, oh, I have a sinus infection. Oh, it might be a chlamydia. Not the kind of chlamydia that's an STD, but it's still in that group. It's just called chlamydophila um, pneumonia. It also can cause malaise, that's the tired, um, and a chronic cough. A lot of times it resembles the walking pneumonia, kind of just like, oh, it's a little bit of food in the lungs. It's not super, super bad. You might not even ever go to the doctor for it. Um, it just takes a while. Eventually your immune system can get rid of it if you have a working immune system. And the third that's in this chlamydia group is chlamydia cytosine. This is a bacteria that is commonly found in birds, 
And people pick it up by having contact with birds. So if you don't ever have contact with birds, low risk of picking this up. But people that have birds as pets are at the highest risk. So this is why, you know, talking to your patient, you're like, well, I see these weird symptoms. And you're like, oh, you have a bird as a pet? There's a lot of random unique things that birds spread. Um, just kind of like red flags of like, oh, you have a bird? All of a sudden you're like, oh, this could be these unique things that only found are in birds. Usually develops into flu-like symptoms, but if you're immunocompromised elderly, which those seem to be the groups that have the most birds, um, it can develop into more severe uh, symptoms. It's picked up by handling the animals. Um, any type of open wound, even if they sneeze, because birds sneeze too, if they sneeze on you, you can pick it up. So if they sneeze on your aerosols or just contact with any infected material or pets, so cleaning out cages, um, handling them, you can pick it up. If you don't have contact with birds, not worried about it, but you probably have patients that have birds as pets. To our third group, of unique bacteria are the spirochetes. Um, they are thin, coiled, I don't know why I just didn't fill this in, helical shaped. Helical shaped bacteria. And when I say helical shaped, it's back to our DNA. It's that corkscrew kind of shape to it, the old telephone cord shape to it, and they actually move using that shape. So they have that foil full coil to them, and so for them to move, they literally will twist themselves um, and, and move just by twisting in a circular corkscrew fashion. So they're grouped because they've got a unique shape. We finally got to some of those unique shaped bacteria. And now I list three here, but we're actually going to, we're not going to even talk about the collective spiral. Um, we're just going to talk about some treponema and Borrelia. Again, two genus that you're like, never heard of treponema before. You've probably heard of uh, the disease it causes, and you're like, nope, never heard of Borrelia. <laughs> You'll have heard of the disease that it causes. Again, sometimes you just don't know the name of the bacteria, but you know the name of the disease. So the first one, the treponema, the official full name of the bacteria that causes human disease is treponema pallidum pallidum. Why it gets too pallidum? The disease it causes is syphilis. Another STD, and if I go all the way back, I'm gonna go back to my little picture. Yes, syphilis in 2021, we had 13 cases. Almost all of them were exclusively in males, um, and part of that is because a lot of females are asymptomatic. Don't get tested, don't know you have it. Three phases, if left untreated, this bacteria can go through all three of these phases. The first phase is known as primary syphilis, and you get canker sores at the, infectious, at the infective site. So this is where you would have canker sores anywhere on your reproductive area. They say they're small, painless lesions. I don't know, they look painful. Um, but that's usually what's gonna take you to the doctor um, to get tested. Still left untreated. It's like this bacteria is not just going to go away with our immune system, and it develops, uh, develops into what's known as secondary syphilis when you have a full, widespread body rash that can last for six to eight weeks. So this is not just like an annoying rash that goes away in a couple days. Six to eight weeks that you've got, oh my God, I know what happened to me. Full body rash all over your body. Again, the bacteria is spreading, and it is getting into blood vessels, and it is doing damage to the body. Now, it's usually somewhere in the six to eight weeks that your immune, your immune system finally gets rid of the bacteria. And so what I don't have on here is there's almost like another little phase that's between the secondary and the tertiary, and it's just a latency phase. Your immune system eventually gets rid of it somewhere in that secondary phase. And then you're like, okay, I'm fine. For years, you're fine. Your immune system got rid of the bacteria. It's not on the body anymore. But what ends up happening is because this bacteria was doing damage to your body for so long, it was damaging your body. It was damaging nervous system. It was damaging your heart muscle. And so later on in life, and depending on how old you are when you picked it up, this could be 10 years, this could be 20 years, this could be 30 years, 
you start to develop what's known as tertiary syphilis. That the nerves that were affected when you were infected, you know, years ago, are now starting to show symptoms of that damage. The heart, which was, you know, can sustain some damage when you're young, as you get older, the damage that was done becomes more evident. And so you start to develop nervous system issues and cardiovascular issues later on in life. Um, the problem with tertiary, tertiary syphilis, can you test for it? Bacteria in your body at this point, like 30 years later? No. <laughs> can you treat for it? It's already done. Like the bacteria were gone, like, you know, 20 years ago. You know, taking antibiotics is not going to do anything from bacteria that died 20 years ago. Um, it's at this point there really isn't anything they can do. Like the damage that the bacteria did are already done. How it's picked up, the number one way that syphilis is picked up is through sexual intercourse. The endemic populations that usually have the highest number of cases um, are usually, I'm going to say they say something, sexually active adolescent prostitutes, and then it can also be picked up with shared needles, so even drug users are at higher risk. This is one bacteria that if mom has it, baby is likely to pick it up as well in utero. And this bacteria causes severe issues with a developing feces. Um, it's called congenital syphilis. Like if you Google it, some of the pictures are like horrible. I couldn't put them on PowerPoint. Um, I was going to say malformations. There's mental issues that are going to happen. I mean, severe, like severe malformations um, of a developing fetus. Um, one unique thing is that will actually cause teeth to be like almost round shaped instead of like flat. They call it barrel shaped. Um, lots and lots of issues to a developing fetus. Healthcare workers. I mean. You are at a slight increased risk because if you are working with patients that have this bacteria and you're not wearing gloves like you should, if you're working with an open wound of a patient that has this bacteria, because you don't always know what they have, um, it does put you at a higher risk of picking it up. Now, the number of cases of syphilis, um, once we figured out how it was spread, it did go way down. This is not because we have a vaccine, we can't say that. Um, but we are starting to see higher numbers of cases um, of syphilis. And yeah, I'm like, here, there's the cross county right there. Um, and we do have cases around here. I was going to say it's, I don't know, depends where you go in the United States. Kind of depends on how your higher cases of syphilis are. But we are starting to see kind of a slight upward trend in number of cases. How they diagnose it, the very first thing is they do a blood draw, as they do a lot of blood draws for things is they will actually look in the plasma of the blood. It's called a rapid plasmin regin. Um, is they're looking for antibodies in the plasma. It's like a super quick test, just kind of like we did that super quick strep test. It's not always 100% accurate, so if that shows up positive, then they're going to do some type of fluorescent antibody test um, looking for the bacteria. They do have a cool helical shape to it, so if you see a helical shaped anything underneath the microscope, a big clue on what it is. Um, but we run into the issues with tertiary syphilis. You can't just screen for the bacteria anymore because tertiary syphilis, they've been gone for years. The only way to diagnose tertiary syphilis is if there was documented case like on your medical record that showed that you had syphilis. You know, like, oh, I see you had syphilis 20 years ago and we didn't treat it right away. Now you're having these symptoms. They just have to put those two and two together. If you don't have any medical record that shows that, they just have to go based on current symptoms and make assumptions. There's just no way to treat it at that point. Otherwise, treatment, um, again, the sooner you can get treated, the better. Penicillin is by far the best and most effective antibiotic that works against this bacteria. Prevention, you know, just don't get it in the first place. Um, abstinence, mutual monogamy, condoms help. Condoms are still not 100% effective. Um, and then, a lot of times they will test mom during pregnancy as well. Um, if they suspect mom might be at an increased risk, um, they will test mom to see if they have to give mom antibiotics so she doesn't pass it on uh, to infants. It's not a routine test unless they know she would be at an increased risk. 
The next group of the spirochetes is Borrelia. Uh, they are lightly staining spirochetes, so they're like super, super skinny, but they have kind of that little swirl to them. And they're still gram-negative, but the number one disease that Borrelia can cause is Borrelia burgdorferi, causes Lyme disease. So if you didn't know the bacteria that causes Lyme disease, it's a bacteria that causes it, and it's Borrelia burgdorferi. It is spread by ticks in the family of Ixodes. There's lots of ticks out there. It's scary how many different tick species are out there. Um, but the Ixodes species or genus of bacteria are the ones that pick up this particular bacteria. So not every tick picks up the bacteria. Deer tick are the top ones. Um, wood ticks, lesser extent, generally your deer ticks. Now, understanding the tick life cycle, and I hate ticks, so I don't even like ticks, but I'm looking at them. But understanding the tick life cycle helps you understand about kind of when are you most likely to get it, um, kind of like where the bacteria is. So I have the life cycle of the deer tick, um, that's the Ixodes, back, uh, the Ixodes genus. Um, so let's see where I want to start. We're going to start at the end, the end of one. Um, when an adult female lays eggs, here's my, we're going to start with eggs. When an adult female lays eggs, my note, eggs are uninfected. So at least that's a good thing. Um, so eggs are uninfected. So when an egg hatches, because eggs are just going to hang out, like eggs are hanging out, tick eggs are hanging out right there. They can survive the winter, but come spring, usually say March, but maybe not right now, April, those eggs are going to hatch into larva, again, uninfected. So luckily the ticks don't always, you know, 100% pass it on or always carriers. Um, when the eggs hatch into larva, they are uninfected, but they are hungry, and so they're going to try to find something to eat. Um, and because they are so tiny, they are usually going to find something small that they can grab onto, like a mouse or a bird, and even they are carriers of this particular bacteria. So those little larvae can pick it up even just from feeding off some other small animal. You can't always get on a deer. Um, and the bacteria is hanging out inside that tick. Now, when that larva bites you, it can be infected. But it usually doesn't have a ton of bacteria, so it is less likely to cause um, the actual Lyme's disease, because your immune system may actually be able to like, recognize those couple bacteria in there. But as it goes throughout the summer, especially if it's a nice warm summer, the bacteria that are in those ticks, those little larvae, because they're still larvae through that whole first summer, are multiplying. So by the end of the summer, when they're still larvae, they are more highly infective. So through, you may get bitten somewhere that summer, not super likely if it's early summer from a larva, but as it goes throughout even into fall, there's more and more bacteria. By the end of that first year, they develop into a little bit larger thing called a nymph. Again, these are still larva and nymph are almost microscopic, like almost microscopic, which means if you got them in your hair, are you going to see them? No, unless you are literally like you know, someone's in your hair, like, looking for anything that might look like a grain of sand. Like, they're extremely, extremely small. Um, but the later the summer and into fall, the more bacteria they could potentially have. The little nymphs can hang out and go dormant in the winter, so there's nymphs out there right now. And then come spring, those bacteria that were in them were reproducing all winter. And if you've been hibernating all winter, what is the first thing you want to do when you kind of wake up? Uh, and they're going to find the first thing they can eat. And so those infected nymphs are going to feed on animals, sometimes larger animals or humans. And so spring is what we're looking for is those nymphs. Um, as they go throughout that second summer, they do start to grow into adults, which are a little bit easier to see, but deer ticks are still really small. Um, so you have to imagine they're even smaller um, come early spring. But they are super infective at this point because the bacteria have been reproducing all winter and they're super hungry. So like as it finally, hopefully, start to get warm out, um, if you want to start hiking, you know, like first warm day, like let's go for a hike. Just don't, ticks are out. Like as soon as the ground is thawed, they are out immediately and they are hungry. So it's kind of in that second summer 
of a tick that when you are at most risk of picking up the bacteria. Again, it's the first summer because they just haven't multiplied a lot. The bacteria haven't multiplied a lot in the ticks. You're still at risk, but it's less likely. It's that second year of the tick. And it's that second year when you get full-size uh, full males, full-size females, and when they can start laying eggs um, and do the whole thing all over again. Now, signs and symptoms of Lyme disease. First, has any of you been diagnosed with Lyme disease? And what signs and symptoms? Um, I didn't really get like bad at like my right arm that was kind of off that. Yeah. Like yep. Um, so signs and symptoms vary a lot. So one of the signs and symptoms are always like, oh, bullseye's rash. Like that's it is a unique symptom for this particular bacteria, is that you can get a bullseye rash at the bite site. However, only about 30% of people actually get the bullseye rash, which means 70% can still have the bacteria and they just don't get that bullseye rash. And obviously, if you've not been bitten by a tick and you get the bullseye rash, like you probably get diagnosed with antibiotics, uh, the sooner the better. Because this is not a bacteria like, I'll be fine. Because the longer you are infected, the more damage is done. Kind of with that syphilis, the more you're infected, the longer you're infected, the more long-lasting signs and symptoms you'll have because the more damage this bacteria does. Now, other signs and symptoms. Um, fever, fatigue, you know, I have to like list all these. Fever, fatigue, headaches, um, sometimes dizziness, sometimes the eyes don't focus super well, um, irritable, um, headache, I'm trying to think, I'm like, Sometimes ringing in the ears, but one unique uh, symptom, like Ben had, this does cause inflammation of a lot of joints. So it's not uncommon that you know all of a sudden, yes, you would wake up and your legs are stiff, your arms are stiff. Um, I, I've known people that have, you know, their kids had it and they're like, "Mom, I woke up and I can't move my arm." You know, I'm like, it's because that causes some damage and inflammation of the joint tissue. Um, again all signs and symptoms, but it can vary so much among individuals. And a lot of times, especially if these ticks are so small and if you were bitten by a nymph um, or a larva, they're even smaller, that you may have no idea that you were even bitten by a tick or you should be looking for any signs and symptoms. Um, if you do not get diagnosed right away, again, you just ignored all those signs and symptoms, um, it can go into what's known as an early disseminated stage. This is when you start to have neurological symptoms um, that you may have extreme headaches, um, you start behaving almost a little bit different, um, you may have different kinds of twitching because the nerves are making muscles twitch. Again, it's affecting the nervous system. It can also get in and cause some damage to the heart and your heart might stay, start having arrhythmias. You know, the problem when you get to this stage is you did leave it go uninfected for quite a long time. And so some of this can cause permanent damage. It's not a no high number. I think it's like 5 to 10% where it can cause permanent damage um, and lead into like late disseminated stage where you have heart issues, you have nervous system issues. Um, and if left untreated, it can develop into severe arthritis at any of those joints um, that were left inflamed for a long period of time. I don't know if they've ever actually traced it right to dementia. Mm -hmm. As dementia, I'm like, I'm going to have to look that up because honestly, would it surprise me? No, because it can cause permanent damage to the nervous system. I just don't know if I've ever seen like the link of Lyme's disease causes dementia. Um, and I'm not sure even if they could 100% say for sure, because who knows, maybe he would have developed dementia. Yeah. You know, like how do you know for sure? So I don't know if they're doing studies or looking at like tracking patients to see, um, but it wouldn't surprise me. I don't know. We have a lot of cases around here. So I know only one of you have actually had Lyme's disease, but how many of you have known someone that's had Lyme's disease? Like, to them you're like everyone, because it's like it's all around here. Um, which gets into my like number of cases. So Lyme's disease is going up 
in the United States. So the number of cases every year is increasing. Yay. Um, if I've, got, I've got no more pictures of maps. So this is to show in the United States where the highest number of cases of Lyme's disease are. Look at us, right there in the middle of here. So Lyme's disease is primarily focused in this kind of Midwest region and over on the East Coast. That's it. It would be very rare. If you ever took a trip somewhere else, it's rare that you would pick up Lyme's disease. Like there are a couple cases here or there, um, but they are primarily focused in these two areas. Um, it originated over in the East Coast. Um, so we didn't always have it in the area, but it was on some ticks on some deer, and we, re we relocated some ticks from like Pennsylvania. We, re we relocated the deer to like um, populate some kind of deer farm story. But we moved the deer from Pennsylvania to us, and then it brought the ticks with it, and brings the deer with it, and yay. That's why these two particular areas are at the highest incidence. But I've got more cases, so I couldn't get a more updated one from 2015. Sorry. But this is the number of cases 2015 of Lyme's disease, so it's all over Wisconsin. And this is kind of showing, you know, the highest at-risk counties um, of Lyme's disease. You know, we're in there. Had one more case too. Nope. Um, but I know, I know, I'm like Monroe County is a top cause. So I think the number is supposed to be even higher. It should be a darker color. Um, and again, it's because of the number of ticks that are on Fort McCoy in the Sparta area um, are at a super high risk of Lyme's disease. Um, Dean Job, it's not a Dean, his first name's Dean. Um, he used to teach micro here too uh, before he became a Dean. And his job was working for Gunderson Lutheran just doing Lyme's disease research. Part of his research sounds horrible. In the spring, he would just have to walk out and like get ticks to climb on him so that he can stick the intestine. Like that sounds like the worst job ever um, to try to get ticks on you. But lots and lots of cases of Lyme's disease. Um, the signs, diagnosing signs and symptoms. A lot of times, especially in this area. I mean, if you've got patients or even yourselves at some point in the future, you likely pick this up. You know, oh, you're from this area? Oh, you were hiking last weekend or, you know, two weeks ago, and now you've got these particular signs and symptoms? I mean, it's a red flag. Now, if you had someone that just came from Texas and was hanging out there and, you know, they don't normally live here and they haven't been here long, they're at a less, you know, less likely. Um, if you're ever a traveling nurse and you go outside of this area, again, unless you, you know, if you're way down here somewhere, you know, it's not really something that's kind of on your back radar all the time of Lyme's disease. Um, the serological test is the Western blot test. So I know that one did immune system tests. The Western blot test is the number one test they look for this. This is when the CDC says you have to have five out of the ten bands. Uh, of the different sized antigens that this bacteria has. Treatment, antibiotics, and again, the earlier you can treat with antibiotics, the sooner you can kill the bacteria, the less likely that you have any long-lasting uh, signs and symptoms. I know people now that didn't get diagnosed right away um, that still have arthritis. They still have issues, some nervous system issues. Um, again, it causes damage. Prevention. And I guess what the prevention is? I'm going to say it's, you know, all those things to prevent you getting bitten by ticks. So it's not just stay inside, but, you know, bug spray, long color, you know, long sleeves, long pants, light colored clothing, you know, doing tick checks all the time, like all that fun stuff. I read an article, it just came out. I'll see if I can throw it on Blackboard today, too. Um, it was interesting. I was like, oh, the timing. It was like, will climate change cause an increase in Lyme's disease? Because again, right now, if you go outside, is your chance of picking up Lyme's disease very high? Nope. And underneath that snow. Um, but if climate change happens and we actually start to have an increase in temperature, will the number of cases of Lyme's disease go up? What do you think? In our area, because I was like reading the article and I was like, really thought about that. So yes, in our area, climate change, global warming, um, we would see an increased number of uh, any tick-borne diseases. So any of the tick diseases, we'd see an increase. But they also said, I mean, there are cases, you know, in southern parts of the United States. 
And so if global warming happens, it actually might cause lots of droughts, and ticks do still need some water. Um, and so you would probably, even though the numbers of Lyme disease would increase in certain parts of the United States, it would decrease in other parts of the United States, so it would kind of all average out. And I was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, so like maybe they said that the number one reason that's really actually causing this increase of Lyme disease, it's not climate change, is the fact that we are domesticating deer. Like, we are building our houses in the woods. And then, I mean, I, I, I think deer, I would love to have deer in my backyard. Because um, they are so pretty, even though I eat them. Um, but bringing deer into your backyard, if you bring deer into your backyard, what are you also bringing into your backyard? You're bringing ticks and the potential of the bacteria that goes with it. Um, a lot of deer, I mean, are so unafraid of humans. Like, they will literally come right into the backyard, you know, be 10 feet from a house. They're not afraid of us. They're not afraid of your dogs anymore. Um, and so as we are moving closer to the deer, that increases the chances and increases the cases more than global warming does. Now, our last, last group of our unusual bacteria are the Vibrio group. So they're all in this genus of Vibrio. When we gram stain them, yeah, they're all gram stain negative. Uh, they are a rod-shaped bacteria but they have a V shape to it. So they have a curve to it, so they almost look like a V. And they do all have a flagella. And so these are normally found in watery environments. In most, Vibrio are tied to more of a salt water environment. But where they get their name of Vibrio is because when they are in the water, because of their shape and their flagella, they look like they're vibrating because they move around. So they look like they're vibrating in the water, and so they call them Vibrio. Of the bacteria that's in this group, um, I'll say one of the more deadly of the bacteria, it's not the number one cause, um, is Vibrio cholerae, which causes cholera. How we pick it up? We ingest contaminated food or water. So we ingest the water that this bacteria is in, or we ingested food that this water, like, watered. So some type of vegetables or fruit that haven't been washed. And the biggest symptom that also causes the most disease or death is rice water stool. Now, my next slide, I'll explain how this happens. Now, I assume at some point in your life you guys have made some rice. What does the water look like? If you had to drain the water off of rice, it's kind of like, yeah, it's kind of like a whitish, cloudy ish kind of look to it. Um, that's what your stool, aka your feces, looks like. Um, what's coming out of you is almost a white, cloudy-ish appearance to it. It's no longer any fecal matter anymore because everything's completely cleared out. But normally, even if you have severe diarrhea, it is a clear, watery solution. This is not. It's a white, cloudy uh, solution that comes out. And it's the toxin that causes it. So it's not the bacteria that kills you, it's the toxin that causes this that kills you. It causes massive amounts of fluid and electrolyte loss. So it has a high mortality, especially because they literally just cannot replace fluids and electrolytes quick enough. So how does it do this? I'm going to bring all my little things up. So if you ingested the bacteria, because you drank some unclean water, ate some unclean fruits and vegetables, the toxin the bacteria makes looks like that. And it targets the epithelial cells that line your small intestine. So this toxin breaks apart, and part of the toxin, this little part, they call it A1, this little part of the toxin gets inside of those cells that line your digestive tract. And there's your little small intestine. It's that little part of the toxin that gets inside of these epithelial cells. It wakes up an enzyme called the adenylate cyclase. Don't care too much about it. But that adenylate cyclase causes what's known as cyclic AMP to be made. Why we care about cyclic AMP? So the cell should normally not be making this, but now it is forced to make it. And cyclic AMP causes these cells to secrete chloride ions and sodium ions. Those are electrolytes. And if you have chlor chloride and sodium leaving, this causes an osmotic change in the water wants to go wherever the electrolytes are going because of osmosis. Um, so water follows the electrolytes into the lumen of the digestive tract, which then leaves as that diarrhea. And so when you have that white rice water stool, 
it's not just water that's in there, it's based on water, but it's that sodium and chloride and all the electrolytes that your cells are losing that causes that white cloudy appearance. And that becomes deadly, because if you lose that much fluids and you lose that many electrolytes, your body's cells can't do all of their normal functions. Now, it is not uncommon that you lose rice water stool at one liter an hour. That's how much rice water stool is coming out of you. So you think of a two liter bottle. Every two hours, you are losing that much fluid. Now, that means they die because of that loss of fluids and electrolytes. Two liters every two hours. That is a lot of fluid that is being lost from the body. If you do not replenish that, you will die within 24 hours. And so the number one treatment is like fluid and electrolyte loss because that right there is what's going to kill you if you don't treat with that. Like they monitor very closely um, how many liters are coming out of the body and they are making sure that they are replacing that same amount of uh, fluids back into the body. Now, for us, luckily, we do not have cholera up here. <laughs> Can't survive uh, the freezing temperatures. Uh, but if you ever travel, if you're like, oh, I want to go to spring break to Mexico um, or anywhere in the, you know, anywhere in South America or in Central America, yes, you are at an increased risk. If you've got patients that just got done traveling somewhere warm and tropical, um, they're at an increased risk of picking up this particular bacteria. So diagnosing it, a lot of it is that very characteristic rice water diarrhea. Diarrhea is always a very fluid, or a very clear fluid, unless it's this bacteria. Treatment, the number one treatment is you have to replace the fluids and electrolytes, and then you are waiting for that back, the immune system to try to get rid of the bacteria. They can try to give the antimicrobial drugs or antibiotics. The problem is, it's your small intestine that is literally like getting rid of everything super, super fast. If you take an antibiotic drug, it's going to leave just as fast as everything else that just went in the body. So sometimes they'll try really strong antibiotics to try to like kill before it leaves. Um, but mostly it's just fluid and electrolytes and time. Prevention, proper sewage and water treatment facility is making sure you don't drink un, you know, unsafe, dirty water. There is an oral vaccine on the market. Um, if you know you would be traveling somewhere that's having an outbreak that's an endemic area, um, it doesn't last a long time. It's like a year, maybe two years that it lasts. So it's not a commonly routine given vaccine. Just got two more bacteria. I'm gonna run a little over, but lab's gonna be short. Um, Campylobacter jejuni is the number one cause of gastroenteritis. Guess what the symptoms are of gastroenteritis? of the stomach and intestine. So diarrhea, vomiting. I mean, that's gastroenteritis. Obviously, it's irritating both your stomach and your intestines, vomiting and diarrhea. Um, but it's not like any old kind of vomiting and diarrhea. Um, Campylobacter jejuni, um, when we grow it in a lab, it actually likes a warmer than normal body temperature, and it has a very specific media that we have to grow it on. How we pick it up? We are eating contaminated foods, milk, or water. Generally, it's fecal contaminated. There are lots of animal hosts that carry this particular bacteria in their digestive tract. So lots of animals, lots of farm animals. Chickens are one of them. They're not the only, but chickens are one of them. Now, if you just got done eating some poultry, some chicken, and you've got vomiting and diarrhea, what might you think you have? I think you have salmonella. So how do you know? So if you eat contaminated chicken, you are at risk of both salmonella and campylobacter. The biggest difference is the diarrhea. Um, salmonella is going to give you a lot of your basic food poisoning symptoms. You've got vomiting. You've got diarrhea. might last 48 hours tops, and then it can go away. It's your body's just way of getting rid of it. This particular bacteria is going to cause more damage to your intestinal tract than salmonella does. Um, that you have more frequent diarrhea for a longer period of time, seven to 10 days of not just regular diarrhea, but bloody diarrhea. And so this is usually you're going to go to the hospital. You're like, I have diarrhea and it's bloody diarrhea. It's because this bacteria does more damage to that intestinal tract, causing that bloody diarrhea. So eating you know, contaminated chicken is never good, uh, but Campylobacter causes worse diarrhea. 
and it is more cases of Campylobacter than Salmonella. Why Salmonella seems to make like the news all the time versus Campylobacter, I don't know. Best prevention, cook your foods properly, proper food handling, you know, don't touch some raw chicken and then touch your cooked chicken and eat it. You know, cook it fully and you'll be just fine. And then the last bacteria is called Helicobacter pylori. And its name tells you a little bit. One, it tells you it's a helical shaped, but you're like, but we're in the Vibrio group. Um, they're not supposed to be helical shaped. Well, they are that Vibrio group, but it kind of has like a quick little twist at the end. So it's a little bit of helical, but it's more of that Vibrio shape. And it still has that one flagella at the end. Pylori is because it affects the stomach, the pyloric region of the stomach. It's where it gets its name. Now, contaminated hands, so you touched something that's had the bacteria. Well water can hold this bacteria if you don't have your well water treated. And then fomites, which are just inanimate objects, so touching desks and chairs and tables and anything else, counters. What this bacteria causes, causes stomach ulcers. I mean, it causes inflammation of the stomach, but it leads to ulcers. So stomach ulcers are not caused by stress, which they used to think, oh, I've got so much stress, I've got ulcers. Stress can aggravate an ulcer, but the ulcer was never caused by stress, like ever. <laughs> it was caused by this bacteria. Now, things that this bacteria has that allow it to cause ulcers. One, it has proteins that inhibit stomach acid. And if you're a bacteria, there's a lot of acid in our stomach, and the idea is that stomach acid kills almost everything you eat, which is why can you eat food off the floor? <laughs> good, really good. Um, I mean, it might not kill everything, so I don't know if you want to risk that. Um, but stomach acid kills a lot. Well, it's got proteins that disinhibit the stomach from making acid, so it's like, oh, less acid you have to fight off. It has flagella that can burrow through the stomach lining. It has adhesion proteins that allow it to stick to the cells of our stomach. And it has enzymes that neutralize the stomach acid, so it long, no longer has that low pH. Now, how the bacteria causes ulcers. So you ate something that had this bacteria in it. Um, it burrowed its way. It kind of has a little white halo around it. That's because it's neutralizing the stomach acid. Now, your stomach, because of that low pH, literally your stomach acid could damage your stomach, but it's lined with a mucus lining to protect itself from that strong acid. So it's neutralizing the acid in the stomach. Because of the flagella, it can burrow through that mucus layer. It has adhesion proteins that allow it to stick to the cells that line our stomach. And so it is neutralizing the acid. It will thin the mucus lining as it burrows through and sticks. If our stomach does not have that mucus lining, that protective lining, doesn't have the protective lining, which means all that acid in your stomach will start to kill and damage all the cells of our stomach. This is what leads to the ulcer, is the bacteria thins that mucus, that protective lining, and the stomach acid literally starts to digest itself. Now, if it causes enough damage, it can get down to where blood vessels are, and now you have a bleeding ulcer, which is never good either. So it's bacteria causes ulcers. How we test? There is a test called a urease test, because it's an enzyme this bacteria makes, that they can actually just test for it really fast. We now have a thing you can literally blow, because the enzyme produces a gas, and we can actually test for it. So like by doing um, a respiratory breath test. We have antimicrobial drugs. We have things that can inhibit the acid production in your stomach um, while your stomach tries to heal itself. Otherwise, prevention, good hygiene, adequate sewage treatment, proper food handling. Again, this bacteria could be anywhere pretty much. Um, has anyone had an ulcer before? No. I swear I had that we talked about it this one semester, and then I had a, a student like the next day like was in the hospital with like a horrible ulcer. She's like, seriously. And I'm like, I swear when I talk about things, I swear they show up in 